conversation in the garden tonight with uh, the Calgary Horticultural Society is hosting a community garden spot. So we're hoping to get a bunch of unique insights on what people are experiencing throughout the city in their community gardens. And we have some special guests with us tonight. So I'll do some intros and um, I'd love to treat this as just, just a way you've set up conversations in the garden cafe where we're talking informally and you know shooting the compost so to say <laughs> and lots of questions um, can come in from the audience so folks that are tuned in now and joining us throughout the evening we've got till 8 30 so whatever is on your mind whether it's community minded garden minded some hybrid of the two throw it at us so Intro is first, we've got um, Cass Mike is with us from the Calgary Horticultural Society, our resident horticulturist. <laughs> Do you live here? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't moved here yet. <laughs> <laughs> Might feel like it, but yeah. Cass has, you've got years of experience guiding gardeners of all stripes um, in communities and otherwise, and we hear your great advice on the radio and on TV, so we're lucky to have you here with us. I'm just hanging out tonight. <laughs> I'm just here to learn. <laughs> she says that, but she's like an encyclopedia. So, um, and then we've got Shelby Chayetsky. I hope I did I say your last yes. name right? Okay, awesome. <laughs> Shelby is joining us from the Aaron Woods Community Garden, a new endeavor, which probably doesn't feel super new to you, but <laughs> groundbreaking recently. And you actually have a garden to garden. Finally, yeah, yeah. So you will bring this new like. You're just going through all those initial growing pains. Mm -hmm. We would love to hear all about that. Um, you did it quick. Yay. Oh, yeah, made it. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> awesome. And then we've got Wayne Hewitt with us from the Mid Sun Community Gardens in Midnapore. And Wayne, we've rubbed elbows a couple times. I gardened down there as well. Uh -huh. And I think I kind of got roped in too. Um, <laughs> but I'd love to hear your story of how you got involved with the Mid Sun Garden. And, what your role looks like there. And uh, yeah, Deb will let us know when you guys have questions. You can chat them in. You can, yeah, however they come through Facebook Live, I'm totally new to this. But uh, fire away. Anytime something comes to mind or as we talk, um, if something comes up, go ahead and ask. Yeah, let's start there. Let's start with your introduction to the, to the garden you work in the most. And even if you have some history before that. Shelby, do you want to lead us off? Start us off? <laughs> yeah, so I had a bit of a different introduction to it. Um, throughout high school, I was in this program uh, at Central Memorial called Environmental Innovation. And it was led by this really amazing teacher who really encouraged us to you know, get outside and engage with the environment and sustainable living and all these different fields. And so when I was in grade 10, one of my projects I did was I helped volunteer at the Altador Community Garden. Oh, cool. And it's like right next to their school and they yeah. get the kids outside and helping mm -hmm. with care for the garden. And I thought that was really cool. And it was so fun to like watch, you know, very young kids. Like I think mm -hmm. they're, you know, six, seven, eight come outside and engage with something that I didn't get to when I was that young. And so throughout this program, it kind of, got me interested in it. And so for my final year of high school, I went to my teacher and I was like, listen, you were, like, you were always doing these kind of projects. I had helped with Grow Alberta, which got free seed kits to mm -hmm. hundreds of kids across Alberta. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I really want to do something. You know, I think, you know, given the experience that I had at Altador, I really want to bring that to my community because we didn't have something like that. Mm -hmm. We're kind of a very, you know, forgotten about community, I guess. We don't have a lot of community spaces like that. Mm -hmm. So I went to him and I was like, you know what, this is what I want to do for my project. And it was through really a school project that we start, I got involved with. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was really cool that I got involved with starting to work on a community garden. And I had kind of heard, you know, through the community Facebook group and my community associations, they'd been trying to do it but it had been years. Like I think they've been trying to get one since 2016, 2017, mm -hmm. and yeah. that kind of wasn't going mm -hmm. anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know what? I'm, I want to do this. I don't, <laughs> I'm going to show up. I'm going to, you know, scream and shout. Let's mm -hmm. get this done. And so then in March of last year, um, we kind of regrouped 
uh, a bunch of the old people who had been working on it came back onto the project. And finally, after a year of like grassroots fundraising and trying to just like get nickel and dimes from, you know, bottle drives and mm -hmm. fundraisers, like I, I sent you the progress, but I think yeah. two or three weeks ago, we finally were able to build the community garden and now we actually have one. So yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. That speaks to the determination you need to launch such a project. When you go to the Altador community school garden, mm -hmm. it, it looks so easy. Yeah. Like plunk <laughs> these metal, you know, galvanized metal planters on the ground mm -hmm. and throw some mulch down. You got the playground and it's all great. Mm -hmm. But man, there's so many pieces that come out of the woodwork when you start to organize. And mm -hmm. Did you find, because folks had been trying prior, you know, sort of stop, start, did you find some resistance to the idea? I don't think I found, we found resistance because mm -hmm. everyone had wanted one for so long. Mm -hmm. um, it was more of, I guess, kind of like apathetic nature uh, to it. It's like, uh, you know, you're saying you're doing it. It's not going to happen. You know? yeah, so time commitment. So yeah. People are, people and are busy, right? The yeah. And Aaron would work really hard. Mm -hmm. They're busy with families and it's hard to find that extra mm -hmm. hour or more per yeah. week hey, to get to get all that stuff organized. It, yeah, it is. I think sometimes, especially recently, it's been a lot to ask like mm -hmm. having to ask your volunteers to come out and help build and mm -hmm. um, help fundraise. Cause like organizing fundraisers can take a lot out of you and yeah. everyone who's helped with the garden, you know, they work full-time jobs, they have mm -hmm. kids, they have to get to school and it can be a lot to ask of someone to help with. But I think the people that I've worked with have been so committed and so just energetic about it that the people who have stayed and helped, you know, it's made all the difference and nice. it really just shows like you need that strong you group of them? people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Make sure they have kids that are involved too, right? Yeah. So take care of the torch. Stuff. So how many goods, beds did you build? Um, we were able to build 20 boxes, oh, good. which is really and good. it's like a sundial almost. Yeah. Got, like, this cool compass shape. Mm -hmm. Do you want to describe what the garden looks like? Yeah. So we built a, like a flower bed centerpiece. I think it's like three tiers tall. And then coming out from it in three rows, we have like a sunburst design. So it's a big it's circle. Yeah. Oh, we, very welcome. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. We, <laughs> the whole time while we were trying to come up with the design, we were like, we just don't want it to look like a cemetery. Because <laughs> yeah. you know, in the yeah, winter, it's you, yeah, yeah, it's like grids and you go out in the winter and it's like, oh, kind of, it's not a cemetery. <laughs> that was, yeah. that was, we just wanted, that was our whole thing. Everyone so were all the beds rented? Not yet. We are almost done renting them all. Okay. So, and we're just kind of in the process of finishing up with the getting all the paperwork and ah. yeah, okay. but almost. Cool. Loads. Mm. Well, kudos. It's um. So I my interaction with the Aaron Woods Community Garden goes back not too far, but to my first days being here in the role as yeah. community development coordinator. <laughs> so I remember, uh, I was like, okay, shall we chance the email about Aaron Woods community? I was like, okay, I don't even know that I have one. I better go look at it, see what it looks like. And then you're like, no, no. It's not there. It's not there. We're just trying. You're like, what resources do you have? So you guys, your group really helped me cut my teeth in this role. I mean, I knew about community and I knew about gardening, but I, I, ha I wasn't totally um, immersed in the role in the role of checking in on all of these mm -hmm. registered community gardens that are with or without a community association mm -hmm. right and that was one of those initial conversations we had was what if your community association isn't necessarily on board mm -hmm. what you, but you still have this vision and this energy behind the project what do you do then so it's interesting that some folks have either bypassed the community association yeah. and done it anyway either on private land or through a different a different um, venue, or they found a way to sway the mm -hmm. community association. So, awesome. Well, I'm, I'm excited to come and see. And yeah. I love that you've built it, you've designed it and built it in a way that suits your community. Mm -hmm. There's no um, template, really, mm -hmm. right? Like, all of Calgary is, um, all our community, you can drive to a neighborhood in the south and it looks a lot like one in the north the houses <laughs> mm -hmm. but the people there and what's going on in the community can be very different and i think it's really a smart thing to make it custom yeah because yes. then the folks that live right there and look at it every day and cut
not to go on their way to work or school or to catch the bus or what, or to just come and sit and see what's going on. They'll feel more at home, they'll mm-hmm. feel more considered. So good job on that. Yeah, that's cool. I'm excited to come see. It's been a good spring because the day that you emailed with the update and the photos of the build, so did Beddington Heights. And I was oh. just like in my office, like, oh, <laughs> doing lots of happy dances. Like we yes. have new gardens. This is like 100 new beds that yes. are going to be uh-huh. growing and food and flowers. And Ogden is just yeah. launched as well. So yeah. And more. There's more on the horizon. Mm-hmm. It was just up in Springbank Hill. They have a beautiful garden that they're going to be first full season mm. launched into theirs as well so it's like it's like seeds of community gardens were just scattered in the last couple of years and um, we were chatting before we went live uh, Wayne about your intro into your community <laughs> garden was like just before the pandemic yeah. do you want to give us some insight into how you've gotten comfy over at Midsun? Well, or have you gotten <laughs> comfy over at Midsun? <laughs> well, I, I, I think so but uh... <laughs> Yeah, I, I just was sitting here thinking uh, as Shelby was talking that uh, I've got a, a rather interesting background for uh, getting into this type of work because I, I spent uh, uh, most of a professional career uh, working in, in gas plants on construction and maintenance and, and, uh, and where you everybody's got their projects priority one mm-hmm. and there's never enough resources and yeah. Ooh, that you sounds know. familiar. Yes, yes. <laughs> and that, then uh, community garden. <laughs> after uh, 17 or 18 years of that I made a total logical switch over into computers. Ah, <laughs> so, okay. And then I got in computers I got mixed up in in help desks uh, uh, global help desks so working with people all over the place that you couldn't understand and couldn't understand you and what have you. Mm. So, so it's a rather, uh, actually it's turned out to be an unusual background combination of the, the computers plus the very physical stuff. So I, I had retired and uh, my wife had uh, taken out a plot in Mid-Sun mm-hmm. and uh, although my mother was a, a very dedicated gardener because we grew up in the north and either you had a garden or you didn't eat, mm-hmm. <laughs> that kind of, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I had never had the gardening bug in any shape or form. I, uh, as a photographer, I really like flowers. I take lots of flower pictures, but the idea of you know, digging in the dirt and, you know, I, I'd rather wait till I see your knees. <laughs> yeah. I see we have a question. Yeah, let's pause because yeah, we'll, we'll I want to hear more of your, your yeah. journey. Go ahead, Doug. What do we what do we have coming in? So we have Karen has uh, written in a question. Sandstone McCune has just put in twelve beds. And she would like some insight into how do you get people to help. Had lots of interest, but no one wants to be on a committee. Mm-hmm. Suggestions, please. That's a tough one. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that may fit in with me continuing my story because that's yeah. just about next. Okay. <laughs> Let's hear it. Good segue. So. Thank you, Karen. And congrats to Sandstone. I know yeah. I'm yeah. following um, your development yeah. as well by email. Thank you for the update. Um, all from design input to siting. So, yeah, take it away, Wayne, because now okay. you're in these growing pains of. Okay, so. Uh, my wife had taken out a plot, and uh, this was the year before the pandemic, and she had volunteered to uh, to do registrations, uh, and she was given this bunch of computer instructions on how to do it, and I looked it over and never having seen it before, decided that, well, that was a little too complicated we could certainly fix that so i said i'd fix it <laughs> so, <laughs> Your first so, yeah. into so so uh, <laughs> i uh, i attended a couple of meetings and i i quickly found out that the history of our garden had been that uh, there had been a founder who looked after it for several years and then it passed to another person who basically ruled over it, uh, you know, 
one person running okay. everything. Okay, like a garden manager? Yeah, and then okay. uh, unfortunately she fell ill and passed away. Mm. And two years before I came along, uh, two, two of the gardeners stepped up to look after things, but they, they basically burned themselves out in those two years because there was no history, mm -hmm. no nothing. They were reinventing so, the wheel yeah, of so, Garden. Well, yeah. well they, they, they all knew what went on, but it had no, never been documented. Okay, so, so creating that legacy binder, yeah. right? So, okay. so they, they, yeah, they literally created the binder, and mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, but they had been doing that for two years, and coincidental with the start of the pandemic, they they had uh, decided that was it. There's okay. they Good had to though. stop. In fact, one mm -hmm. of them actually left the garden, mm -hmm. uh, and and so. I was coming into some of the committee meetings uh, trying to sort out their computer stuff and uh, uh, I don't know what happened, but somehow or other... <laughs> you brought Apple printers. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I ended up... Uh, uh, Oh, I, because they had elected a president. Oh, okay. Uh, and so I... Of the garden or the community uh, association? Of the community association. Okay. No, sorry, the, the garden. Of the garden, okay. Uh, and uh, I had decided, okay, I, I would work with her, but behind the scenes, I would support mm -hmm. her and help her with the stuff that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And then she up and got transferred to White Court. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> Huh. See it as I already had my fingers involved in a lot of it. Uh, there was just some kind of tacit approval that I was the new committee yeah. chairman. So I uh, I warned them that uh, I I knew too much about how I did these things, and they probably wouldn't like it within a year. But <laughs> <laughs> they, they decided to go ahead anyway. Now, the 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 issue that we're just brought up talking about was that. Uh, we had at the time, like, I think maybe eight or ten people were listed as being on the garden committee. Mm -hmm. The reality was maybe yeah. three of them mm -hmm. were doing anything. Okay. So, uh, over the period of the first year, which was, well, basically we were in pandemic mode, we had to sign in and out of the garden. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, they weren't even going to let us have a garden, and then they... Uh, uh, the government declared the community gardens to be an essential service. Yeah. And and I made a proposal to the community association that, okay, here's how we could do it. Mm -hmm. uh, because although I wasn't into the garden, I am an organizer and a, I, can, I can write uh, instruction sheets with the best of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got started, but the, the result was that now, this is the third year, we still haven't had a garden meeting or an election since the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we've shed, so we say maybe eight of the people that were nominally on the committee but, but weren't doing anything. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say not doing anything. We're, we're basically just there in name only. Uh, and uh, after two years of experience, we we increased the committee by two people who were gardeners, both new gardeners, but had shown their the desire to garden. The desire yeah. to garden. So okay. we brought them on, and uh, this this year uh, I, I'm in the process of uh, uh, looking for people to to succeed me in terms of the administration and the computer work. And how are you doing that? Uh, we, have, uh, doing that? we have quite a, quite a lengthy uh, uh, application form where mm -hmm. we ask all kinds of questions and, and uh, we require people to, to commit to five hours of volunteer work mm -hmm. with us during the year. And uh, we offer them a choice of volunteer jobs that we have. They can pick one, two, three. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, 
this year I introduced another area called admin jobs, you know, like computer input, uh, grant writing, there, there's three or four of them. But pointed out if you volunteer for these, uh, uh, we're, we're not going to be bean counting, but when you get to five hours, you can't quit. You That's take great. on one of these, <laughs> you're, you're, you're here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and actually, we had a, a number of people say they'd at least look at it. That's so I, promising. I'm, yeah, so I'm, I'm just in the process of interviewing them now. And okay. got so you're about kind of holding half. it like a, almost like an internship or like a job yeah. posting kind of. So yeah. putting it out there in... In putting it out there in the format of how you get your volunteers organized yeah. in general, yeah. so you're already streaming in yeah. your gardeners um, to potential jobs they might feel yeah. comfortable in. And how are you going to know if you are a new gardener, if you like composting or you like yeah. working in the orchard or whatever it is that you want to do? Yeah. Um, but yeah. I, before we jump to the next question, yeah. I, I want Chelsea, or Shelby, do you, sorry, <laughs> do you have any insight? In, like, you, you had, I mean, when I first met you, it was you and two other gals. Yeah. Yeah, and how are you, are you larger now, your group, or do you feel like you've got more support in the committee forming and the or, behind the scenes organizing? I think definitely now there's a lot more support mm -hmm. now that it's, we've actually now shown. people can see. Yeah, they can see yeah. tangible proof that. Yeah we were doing something yeah. <laughs> in the beginning. I think there was a lot of support there, you know, mm -hmm. in the early stages we had, I think like 10 people who mm -hmm. were regularly coming to meetings and offering support and then slowly, you know, life gets in the way yeah. and yeah. they teeter off. And right now it's me and I think four others who are doing the brunt of the work. Mm -hmm. And we'll have like the odd person, like when we were building the garden, we had a bunch of people come in to help. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't really interested in gardening or doing any admin stuff. They just Maybe wanted they like tools yeah, and yeah. Yeah. with wood. We had yeah. this one guy who came, he was like, ah, I just like building. Awesome. <laughs> so, and every yeah. community garden needs at least one of those mm -hmm. folks. Yeah. One, yeah. Somebody who enjoys hands-on, Yeah. like forget the potatoes and the peas. We're just giving it to the saw and a yeah. drill, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Give them a task and yes. yes. mm -hmm. feed yes. them well. I don't yeah. know. Have a barbecue <laughs> or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. I think the hardest was during the winter because we didn't have a garden. We, you know, it was really just us meeting and trying to think of ways to fundraise any money. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I know some other gardens, they were able to get some funds from their community associations, but in Aaron mm -hmm. Woods, we're very like low yeah. income, middle, low class, and mm -hmm. our community association is not wealthy. And they can't, mm -hmm. they, they wanted to, but they couldn't just give us resources. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think during the winter, what really helps is just finding things to keep busy. To, mm -hmm. So we would be prepared in the spring to build. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were able to get a bunch of wood donated. And one of our gals, um, her name is Stacy. She like all winter, she was like, I got this fundraiser we can do. I got this fundraiser, like mm -hmm. all winter. She kind of became yeah. like the go-to fundraiser. So you identify your, your cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And yeah. then you play to their strength. Mm -hmm. And I think probably for Karen's question um, for folks at Sandstone and beyond, I think not letting it all rest in them yeah. as the, the original kind of, or the, yeah. Previous two leaders there at Mid Sun, like uh, creating that legacy binder where somebody like myself, who is way more comfortable mm -hmm. in the compost pile, yeah. <laughs> compost yeah. than like communicating and organizing mm -hmm. people and juggling schedules, um, where I could like take that binder and just go through a couple pages and feel like, okay, this is how it's been done. I don't have to totally encouraging mm -hmm. mentorship. Yeah, 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 encouraging mentorship. Getting the guy yeah. next door in the other bed to talk to you about what mm -hmm. they do yeah. Is, yeah. is part of it. And, and I mean, it is a social activity mm -hmm. that is fairly easy oh. going. And like Joanna, I'm most comfortable in a certain part of the garden. I like to plant seeds. Hence the reason right now I have 150 broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> But that's important too because yeah. folks that are busy sending emails and fielding yeah. phone calls and writing grants, that's are right. probably not finding the time to plant their mm -hmm. radishes. That's right. And so sharing them. the wealth with your community garden or sharing the major. It, uh, it is uh, it's kind of odd. At the end of last year, uh, 
for the first time in our garden's history, we did an extensive survey of, uh, it was extensive. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. and it was kind of funny <laughs> because uh, uh, we had one comment, uh, would you please stop these people from coming up to me and telling me what to do? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And then on the other hand, there's... Uh, the ones that we, want yeah, we, yeah, we really want something. So as a result of that, we've already modified next year's application to say, do you want a mentor? Yeah, I saw mm -hmm. that piece in, yeah. the, in the application. Or do yeah. you want to be a mentor? Yeah. Uh, and help, yeah. help yeah. or like host a learning night. Yeah. That would mean. Well, yes. well, Joanna, you've seen our application and our uh, yeah. welcome document. Is that worthwhile sharing with some of these I newer people? I think absolutely. People? I think, um, yeah. I, I, I always err on the side of more communication is better. You can always uh -huh. subscribe or back out if it's too much for you. But I think for myself, it was really helpful. I, yeah. I am pretty well versed in gardening. I already have a passion for working with community. But I came into the Mid Sun Garden sort of like, how does it work? And who do yeah. I talk to to get this? get into the shed and can I just show up and work in the compost uh -huh. so to have that um, that written document um, that I can keep and refer to throughout the season has been invaluable uh -huh. and I think it would really help other community gardens um, have, a, have uh -huh. a template or have something that they can yeah we can certainly make it, make it available yeah. uh, mm -hmm. one thing though is in, in essence I brought our garden into the computer age uh, and one of the issues that came up was we had a couple gardeners leave because they weren't willing to use email. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so this year's application right up near the top says if you can't or won't use email, you might as well stop right now. Okay, so <laughs> then there's some limitations to yeah. how we communicate. And so... Yeah. But we have too many people. We yeah. can't phone people. Yeah. It's either email or, or Facebook. Maybe those people who don't want to email would be in charge of a bulletin board hmm. and they could keep the bulletin board updated <laughs> yeah, or they can, what, how, yeah. and communities are so um, yeah. adept and creative at problem yeah. solving and keeping things accessible and inclusive. Yeah. So, well, that's good insight. I hope that helps folks. And we have that's another question coming in. It's not a question so much as um, the community, of course, is providing input as well. So Evan was suggesting, and perhaps uh, the two of you can comment on it, that with renting, you must commit to two hours per month. I know you were saying five <laughs> per yeah. year, but two hours per month and uh, whatever makes sense, of course, for your garden. And he was also saying that he'd seen that at other community gardens, that that's yeah. one of the challenges is trying to get people working with uh, committees. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, oh, he's got quite a few comments in here. Let me just... And then offering a discount to people who will, um, for their bed rental, if they commit to a considerable amount or more challenging positions to volunteer. So I'm just, I'll just read um, a few things in here. Some of the other agencies that do have community hour practice, they have higher costs for beds. Once the, once the hours are completed, they get a refund or a discount equal to some amount. Mm. Uh, people. Yeah, so that, that might, might help. So if they get their volunteer hours committed, then they get their $25 back, of course, that's really needing to keep track of those hours, being able to do that. And then there's a question in here too. Shall I just continue? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we, Evan also has the question. After speaking with different gardeners, the gold standard is to plant in the ground. Apparently that's a lost practice or a red flag. Is the city allowing this? Do they require a barrier between public land and the garden soil when setting up new beds or land? Uh, what is the right set, set up? Fabric, then soil, fabric, then cardboard, then soil, cardboard, fabric, mulch. So wanting to know how to set up a bed properly. So a little bit of hands-on how-to and then looking at soil remediation and or not. And what is appropriate? Do you have to have a raised bed or can you plant in the ground? Yeah, um, Kath, I, I'm sure you have some insight on this. I, I think it depends what you're growing. 
I would it start depends with that. on what you're growing in. It depends on what, where your community garden is. If it's on private land, or the community association has agreed that you can plant without a raised bed, and you can plant down on your Renfrew community garden has quite a, a really interesting setup in that they planted in the ground in that they are doing uh, fruit bearing trees and shrubs and they've done other display of, you know perennial fruit mm -hmm. and perennial mm -hmm. vegetables so they've got those in the ground and then the raised beds are for the other yeah. core other plant material but there are one or two of the newer gardens that are down more at ground level and are fairly interesting to look at and, and I think that they're getting more and more permission from the city parks department to allow them to do that. The only thing is that it can't interfere with the lawnmowers. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever watched one of those lawnmowers go around, <laughs> no, <laughs> why you don't want They're fast. Yeah, they're yeah. fast and they're working on a yeah. number of gardens. But a lot of the gardens now, um, up in, um, is it scenic acres? But the one with the Silver Springs. Silver Springs. Their community yeah. garden is completely fenced, but on the outer edge, they've planted fruit trees and it's down in mm -hmm. ground level. Mm -hmm. So that's what you have to look at and you do have to apply for that. Oh, well, so. we just up and did it. <laughs> I was just about to yeah. say, however, I've noticed that Mid Sun has planted in the ground. Mid Sun has a pollinator berm, <laughs> yes. um, which has some medicinal and culturally significant mm -hmm. plants in there that would be used um, in a way where you might ingest them. Mm -hmm. There's also like uh, more or less a food forest going yeah. in. Yes. Cherry, you know, cherry trees, fruiting trees, uh, fruiting shrubs. And we're starting to see this more and more, so I love the point that you bring up, Evan, about where and how do we plant these things. Yeah. Uh, soil yeah. testing is really key, and not just like plunk, here's one soil sample, but all around your site, um, I think is super important, really whether it's important. public or private. Um, I can speak to the, the Sutana Nation Community Garden was an open field. Um, at the base of uh, kind of the runoff from a hard packed gravel parking lot and they have an in-ground enclosed uh, growing space where they have lasagna gardens, so sheet mulching. And their method was um, they scraped the existing plant material off, but not to the right depth because there's all kinds of clap grass roots and mass weed and all that stuff in there. Yeah. And so they put down cardboard um, again, thinking of budgets, they probably could have done landscape fabric, but that's a Cost. that's a plastic, um, you know, that's a uh, oil derivative. Is you know, I don't know. Um, is it effective over the long haul as a landscape person? I say no, <laughs> especially in an open field surrounded by aspen grove and you know wildlife and all that. So really windy site. So they chose cardboard um, and fresh chipped mulch from a from an arborist and just layered and layered. They did that the first year, had pretty good success in their sort of mounded rows, and then it was full of weeds and they went back and did it all over again from scratch. So again with the cardboard and the mulch really mm -hmm. thick. So there's probably at, at the end of last season, I was out there helping, there was a foot of mulch um, on the ground there. And it, I'm sure it's shrunk by half now. So mm -hmm. And then they have raised beds as well that are full of weeds um, <laughs> around the edges. It's awesome, and, the, and that's, that's a place to start, but you always have to think about what do you want in there and what are you trying to keep out? Yeah, so yeah. Twin <coughs> Views, which is around the corner from you guys mm -hmm. in Dover, they're on a um, uh, defunct tennis court, yeah. right? And so they had to build up, and when they were building their little beautiful walk, through perennial bed area, that was a major hassle for them mm -hmm. because I think they have an apple tree in there. I think that's their tree in there, but it it was like the probably the the process from like just that made everyone want to quit because the city was saying that soil isn't appropriate for food producing plants. They're saying like this is an apple tree, it's not lettuce, and so I know they went through a whole ordeal. And if anyone from Twin Views is with us tonight, I'd love for you to share if you know anything about that little corner, um, hear more about that spot.
but uh, yeah, I, I was going to comment that uh, I, I noticed on where our garden's laid out, which is a lease from the city, uh, they had about a 20 foot setback from the fence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, I went to our uh, city coordinator and she went to parks. I wanted to find out what are the rules for that 20 feet. And all that came back to me was that uh, we couldn't build any structure on it. Mm -hmm. uh, we could plant trees and such on it, but the minute we padded goodbye with a shovel, they belonged to the city. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that's and, in terms of pruning and yeah. well, no, no, of they, the trees? We're, we're okay to look after them so long as we're in the garden, okay. but we didn't have the right to remove them. Okay. Once they're planted. <laughs> locked in. Uh, they they, they become the other, part of the city's inventory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Then the other thing was uh, we are fenced by the city on the north side. We're bounded by the, our building on the south side. East and west are wide open mm -hmm. to a skate park and a school playground. And, all. and they, they didn't uh, want us to put a fence up. So... Uh, out of self-defense, uh, I put a big hedge in there. <laughs> Didn't ask them, just put it in. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's alternate, uh, alternate cherry, cherry and Saskatoon bushes. And when they grow up, there are plan as if it's on the outside, the public can have them. And if it's on the inside, it's for the gardeners. That's so great. It's mm -hmm. inviting yeah. and it's yeah. also containing. Yeah. And it's not just... Uh, who or what we're keeping out, but that's a bit of a windbreak. Yeah. That's a buffer for the pollinator berm that's inside all that. Yeah. I was going to say one other piece about the actual hands-on building of the bed. If you're on open ground, open soil, you're not building on blacktop or an old tennis court or something like that, you need to think about burrowing animals. Um, so uh, with our Chinatown garden, the, the Calgary, the Chinese Calgary Elderly Citizens Association put in a garden last year and they lined the bottom of their beds with metal mesh, with, mm. the, with the finest uh, opening yeah. metal mesh so that a vole's head could not fit through or a <laughs> uh, uh, ground yeah. squirrel or gopher. I did that on our own bed mm -hmm. because we had a, a, a ground squirrel dig in from 20 feet away mm -hmm. and come up in our bed. So yes. I, I dug it's like it all It's like the Bunny movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like that guy. Yeah. <laughs> you pull the carrot and it gets pulled right back yeah. down again. Yeah. Or in my, in my home garden, I've pulled up my cylinder beet and yeah. there's no root. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, just, that's thanks a, for the greens, but yeah. the bowl's got the rest of it. So yeah. Yeah. Um, whether it's cardboard or landscape fabric, I would first I would put the... You can either do that above or below the hardware cloth, but I think that that metal barrier is really important. Um, and then you need a physical barrier that's going to suffocate and and um, block sun and air, basically, to grass or whatever's under weeds, whatever might be under the raised bed um, or the in-ground planting. I, I like working up. I just feel like it's much easier than digging in and right. tilling seems to be falling out of practice with all we know about microbial yeah. activity. And I, I was going to say too that uh, putting it at ground level basically eliminates a certain age class of people from using it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Accessibility, and, and, yeah. And, uh, and it doesn't matter your age, I'm six yeah. foot two. I would much rather be yeah. sitting on, my, on the edge of my bed as opposed to being on my hands and yeah. knees. I well, can't do that for too long. You haven't seen it yet, but just last night, actually, we installed a, 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 what we're going to call our pumpkin patch. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I bought a, a used water tote, cut it in half, put a frame around it, so it's, I don't know, it must be almost two feet high. Feet height. Mm. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> Sitting height. And it's, 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 it was exactly the right height for someone who can't bend over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want a really good example of accessible raised beds, you should go to the Mount Royal Community Garden. It yes. has, it's, and Renfrew has some good ones. Um, Winston yes. Heights has some good ones. Springbank Hill has some good ones. But I, w I was just there last weekend at the, the community garden at Mount Royal, and it is so cool because you can wheel, as opposed to wheeling under the bed, if you're in a wheelchair or you're using a walker or you need to sit while you're gardening, it's the bed is sort of uh, vertical on one side and then sloped on the yeah. other. So 
So it's like a wedge that mm. you can put your knees right under. And I tried it and I fit. And I have long <laughs> legs, so it, it was really a cool idea. So accessibility yeah. is a great thing to think about yeah. because we're invite. It's not just me and how I'm going to build this bed. It's people yeah. I haven't even met yet. Well, the, these so. these one I built the, shouldn't say I, I I designed it, but uh, when we cut the tote in half, we end up with a bed that's say roughly three and a half by seven, mm -hmm. but it could just as easily have been two square ones, mm -hmm. which would be easy to reach in from a wheelchair mm -hmm. sideways sideways yeah. yeah that can get painful over no time but it well. yeah can be can. done yeah. or a small child yeah that's kind of a good height for them that's just yeah. under the armpit right i, I saw <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> pumpkin have you been up to crossroads garden i haven't yet but I've been okay, they, they have uh, one where you can wheel underneath it nice. or two of them i think i think that it brings up a good point not just in in how it should be done, or maybe I should say could be done, because there's many different ways to build mm. your beds, whether you are working in the ground or in a raised situation. But to think about, like I always say this, and it's maybe it's annoying, but community garden. <laughs> the first word is community. So we have to think about who is around us and who, um, if we don't build things for all the folks that we can imagine and have them involved in that design phase and the, those first implementation pieces, we probably won't see them coming through. And then well, it invites the community yes. to come. Mm -hmm. If yeah. it becomes an accessible garden, mom may come mm -hmm. to help garden mm -hmm. and share her wisdom. It's yeah. all part and parcel of yeah. the mentorship of what a garden is and what it means to us. Although to be. we've had some issues with people who think community garden means, oh, I can come in and have some. Oh, yeah, they do that, too. Yeah. This is a big topic. Yeah. This yes. is a topic we could probably talk about for the whole hour and a half. Yeah. Yes. Um, and some folks look at that like vandalism. Other folks look at that like a communication issue. Sometimes well, English is not the first language. Renfrew has a great cultural signage purposes. for that, mm -hmm. and they have one bed. But if you want to pick some, pick it, but please leave yeah. some yeah. for us. Yeah. That's kind of... Yeah. Mm -hmm. this is, and, and I've seen it in oh. use, which is great. Saw so a family come over and pick out of the you pick bed, which was yeah. Yeah. awesome. Well, that, that's where we're heading with our hedge. And on the other side, uh, we're getting ready to put in a raspberry hedge. Mm. Oh, good. Same, same idea. That's security right yeah. there. Yeah. That's <laughs> security. <laughs> yeah. All right. I hope that helped, Evan. And thank you for the good points, too. Yeah. That's awesome. It's not, it's not so much a question as a comment. Karen was just, uh, you had asked whether or not um, templates would be helpful or your how-tos would be helpful. And she said, yes, definitely about the application forms and how you put your binder together. So all that documentation that works well for you, if that could be shared, would find that very helpful. And actually, we did just get another question in. Kareen is asking, we are going to put a French drain in around our house, but we have a 35-foot spruce tree close by. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, any tips for protecting the spruce's roots? Both, um, we dig the when we dig the trench and we refill it with rocks, is it safe to dig a drainage trench past the spruce to the far side of the apron? Could the drainage trench harm the spruce's roots. Depends Kathy, how close. Kathy, you're nodding your head. I bet there's a few opinions on this. But okay. Yeah. A spruce growing up like this, if you lay it down, the roots go that far. But if you lay it down a second time and the tree is over 30 years old, that's how far spruce roots can go. Digging in a fresh drain onto the top of a spruce tree is really harmful because what will happen is that the spruce will suffer damage on one side of it, so you'll have a one-sided tree because you'll be cutting into left grain, right grain, and that's how a spruce works. So mm -hmm. if you cut the left side roots, the right side of the tree is going to die or suffer mm -hmm. damage. But putting in a fresh drain and using rock is a good idea for drainage and for helping the water, but Having to go along and trench the side of spruce is kind of kind of. How far away did she say it was? It was she's she says uh, well, uh, six to eight by our house, six to eight feet. 
But I can tell you, I have trenched beside the spruce right through the roots. I mean, yes. there's the big ones, you can dig around them. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it is the happiest looking spruce you ever did see because yeah, it always so, gets I a drain. Never, never saw into the main roots of the spruce. Yeah. Dig to where the roots are, rock around it, and keep going. It won't, it's not going to kill them. It's, I mean, they've been there probably a long time. They're probably going to be They fine. have a lot of... But if it's roots. that close to the house, it will already have gone away Elsewhere, the other way. Yeah. Yeah. It'll and go maybe a different you don't direction. want those roots that close to the house to begin with. Yeah. I, from kind of my landscape background, I would say if it's getting wider than your lower leg and the root, it's probably a pretty important one. Yeah. <laughs> but things that are like kind of arm diameter and thinner would be okay to yeah. probably cut through. And those weeping um, drain pipes, the sleeve weeping pipe that you'd be using in your French drain are flexible, they're corrugated. Yeah. So yeah, go under. I also ID, have. Go <laughs> under. Uh, <laughs> don't forget to put the sleeve on the drain. The sleeve needs I was going to say they too. have holes in them. <laughs> um, the sleeve needs to be there so the silk doesn't fill your pipe and stop the yeah. whole stop the whole process. process. And then when the when the French drain is done and you backfilled everything, um, ideally you, your your French drain is uh, the pipe is sleeved and then you're going to be fabricing the um, between the rock and the soil above. And that spruce the spruce tree is going to send out roots that find that nice cool wet soil. Pipe mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. I would say given a choice, you should use pipe, not hose. Yeah. Because if you do ever have to clean it, uh, you the can pipe, brush pipe is much easier to clean. Unless yeah. you find you have to do this. But the principle <laughs> behind a French drain <laughs> is to disperse moisture yes. throughout yeah. the landscape. So You have yeah. to perforate the pipe. So I, I'd be well, careful saying that you should have a solid pipe just because no, of the No, I wasn't thinking solid, but yeah. uh, I don't know about now, but back in the day that we used to get four inch perforated pipe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have yeah. ABS that's mm -hmm. like that out yeah. there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You might have exactly. to purchase some elbows to get yeah. under, yeah. depending <laughs> on the root situation. Yeah. But yeah, It'll be drainage, is a, drainage is a interesting topic that often doesn't get a lot of air time, but is like probably the most important thing yes. that we do as gardeners. Mm -hmm. Yes, is, it is. Is how water moves through the site and <laughs> whether we can capture it, how we can divert excess. Um, well, yeah. it's, it's you were talking about using cardboard under the bed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The thing about cardboard is it's hydrophobic. Mm -hmm. So if you don't wet it uh -huh. before you pile soil on top of it, it'll spend oh, four or five months absorbing all the moisture you put into the bed mm. until it's ready to disperse. Good point. Wet the cardboard. Wet the cardboard <laughs> before you put it down. <laughs> And, okay. and don't just wet the side that you can see. Turn it over and wet both sides. Yeah. Hard lesson learned on and several. And be general. Be be um, generous with the layering. Don't do yes. one layer good, no. one ply cardboard. Mm -hmm. I put it down really thick. Yeah. Um, there is some um, talk out there. There's some science around how cardboard stops gas exchange from below ground to above ground, but if you're working in a raised bed, you're already pretty much Mitch changed the gas exchange. suffocating it. And what's more important, yeah. you, you're creating an environment that uh, from scratch pretty much. Mm -hmm. So you you are already taking more control than mother nature generally gives That's us. That's right. Yeah. So you well, have to- Well, it's like the Ger German Hugelkirk. Uh, Hugelkultur? Culture. Yeah. I always <laughs> want to call it a church. I don't know why. Culture. Culture, culture, the Hugo culture, <laughs> <laughs> and putting all those branches and then building yep. your garden over top of it. Yes, definitely yes. has air circulation. Definitely has benefit, mm -hmm. but it takes a lot of continuous adding of soil yes. till you get the right preferred depth, yeah. and it takes a while to grow root crops into the Hugo mm. culture. Yeah, so that's, that's uh, another option for Evan and and folks yeah. building raised beds. And again, we we did that out at the Sukuna Gardens. Yeah. They had huge poplar logs that were um, aged and rotting down already and they just threw them in these big, they have uh, yeah. tall raised beds that are about three feet tall mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. were about two feet is just logs and, mm -hmm. and tree cuttings, branches uh, and then we, soil. We filled ours with mulch. Nice. Yeah. Similar. It's carbon. You're introducing yeah. a source of carbon that mm -hmm. is most likely inoculated with some pretty good fungus and that's why you want it in the bed to begin with. 
Yes, more questions. That's great. Just on, on your filling your raised bed with mulch, mm -hmm. what should the depth of your soil be? And then, as well, just a follow-up question about the spruce and the rocks. Is it okay to put rocks around the roots that are close to the house? Yes. Yes, <laughs> I think so. I think yes. it would be helpful. You want to discourage roots from growing towards your foundation anyway. Yes. Um, and spruce roots are pretty beastly. So yeah, they are. They wander where they want. Yeah. Um, I think the depth on soil is it varies. And what what have you guys done in your garden sites? What do you have a consistent like? Are all the beds two feet deep, eighteen inches deep? Right now, all of ours are I think two feet deep. Two feet. We just got a grant, so we can add some more diverse boxes. Yeah. Um, at, by the end of the month, but right now they're all about two feet deep, and I don't quote me on this because I wasn't there when we did the. I only got there like halfway through the day when we were filling the boxes. But, yeah. <laughs> but I think what they did end up doing is um, uh, cardboard mulch and yeah. yeah, I think that's what they did end up doing. Two feet so, is a pretty good guideline, yeah. especially if you're going to grow root crops. Mm -hmm. Maybe sample. Yeah. I think eight sample. inches. Generally, you'll find it if you're building with wood. It's sort of determined by My the if, you're, on the if you want to grow potatoes, you need a at least two feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. At least two Icon feet. radish, potatoes. Mm -hmm. yes. I don't know if you want to grow those killer cylinder beets or if you Oh, they're killer. They're so good. Get the biggest, longest one. Daikon radishes only need about that much. Really? Know? Yeah. I've seen yeah. them get that big. Well, well again, I have two. So if you, oh, well, let's say you only have uh, two by six and that's what you're building your raised bed with and the height is six uh -huh. inches, well, you probably, that's fine, but you'll probably want to look at more shallow rooted veggies like lettuce. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. No, some, beets. Beets don't yeah. like shallow roots. Right. They, and they like the soil to have a certain coolness to it. And if the roots, if the soil's too shallow, it warms up too much. So you've uh -huh. got to we'll stay on top carrots. of it. And carrots, carrots like the cool, moist soil when they're mm -hmm. first germinating. So you have to be careful, but two feet. Two feet, uh, two, 18 two, inches to two yeah, feet. I think if you're around feet. a foot, you're fine. If you yeah. start to get less than a foot, you're going to be faced with those challenges of drying out. My mom used to have four yards of soil delivered to our back corner of our house. And every year she planted potatoes up the hill and down the hill. Oh, right into and, the pile. Uh, why right into the pile? All the way up and all the way down. I loved that as a kid. My kids would have that pile spread out in the yard so Well, fast. that's what she did for it. Because we would climb up and spread it around. But by the same token, she would harvest the lower potatoes. And then when the season was ending, the ones she harvested from the top of the hill went in the cold into the oh, Imagine the pumpkin patch you could grow on top of that yeah. hill. Yeah. <laughs> well, well at, at our work bee last night, we had uh, one lovage plant that was had to come out because of where it was, and uh, uh, was we, it? we we got yeah we got down about the eighteen root? inches. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the the root at the surface was about two inches in diameter. Yeah. And even at eighteen inches, where we finally got to where we could break it off, it was at least an inch. Well, <laughs> so yeah. you don't need to plant lovage in your raised bed. No. <laughs> no. You can put that on the side or on the, if you can it, like creep out of the raised it bed. Show, it showed definite signs of being a weed. Yeah. <laughs> My That's lovage sort of like I came from the Mid Sun Garden. Yeah. I, I would actually blame that lovage plant at the Mid Sun Garden for, well, credit, blame. Or, <laughs> That's why I'm at the garden now because yeah. I, some gal was, I think it was Debbie, she uh. was digging it up and. Um, I was like, well, you're going to compost that? She said, we have too many. And I said, I just can't grow mine from seed. And she said, don't bother, take this. And now yeah. I have lovage everywhere. So I don't try to grow it because I got tired of trying to figure out what to do with it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> my Euro Eastern European in-laws love it. They call it a Maggie plant, like the Maggie uh, oh, bouillon. The bouillon. It's yeah. a soup. I know it's a soup. Soup and stock and stuff. Stock but yeah, like it's that. potent. It's a potent yeah. herb. Yeah. yeah. When you buy that soup in the grocery store, M-A-G-G-I. Yeah. Lovage. Yeah, that's pretty well the <laughs> yeah. flavor. It's a yeah. very intense celery flavor. Yeah, it's very intense. Mm -hmm. Very intense. Deb, did we have another question or was that, that was the two-part question? That was the two-part, yeah. Okay. The rots and the Great. depth. Cool. Well, I would love to hear from you guys around um, some
successes and challenges or like what you feel super, I can almost guess, but like what do you feel like the most proud of and what, what it, what's kind of like lingering, you know, so we're going to have to deal with that soon or things that you <laughs> have noticed coming in as a challenge and take it away, whatever comes to mind. Kath, you too, I know you've been in and out of community <laughs> gardens or even home gardens, a lot of stuff that applies at that community level we can translate into our backyards or our balconies. Well, I did allotment gardening while I lived in the UK. Yeah. And they were, they are, without a doubt, a community all onto themselves. And mm -hmm. the things that I learned from them were, for starters, I when I started, I didn't know that I had to communicate, or not communicate, but participate as much as I did. Yeah. And I knew that there had been a thing in the lease about giving so many hours, but I became absolutely enthralled with the communal part of the allotment because we had a big shed, and when they do opened the doors of this shed, it was like a gold mine, and they sold stuff out of it, right, and um. they shared tools out of it, and on the doors of the shed were the job jars. Okay. If you will, of what yeah. tasks, you know, who did what. And they rotated it by the bed number you were in. Okay. So everybody yeah. got experience it's in the different doing things. Doing in the different things. That's so and I really good. liked the fact that they shared their produce and they talked mm -hmm. to each other about what they did and didn't grow. Mm -hmm. And that was the part that, and I loved the fact that um, the old boys would arrive with their wheelbarrows and they walked from their home to the commune, <laughs> to the garden, and they would sit in their wheelbarrow and drink a beer. That's the best mm -hmm. recliner. Oh, <laughs> lazy yeah, boy. Yeah. And I knew I'd made it the day that they invited me to join them for a beer. Awesome. So, <laughs> but the thing that I was going to point out was that I learned from them that there's three kinds of, of critter that inhabits a communal garden or, as you will, an allotment. And yes, there are the varmints. Mm -hmm. the animals that come in. There are certain critters that you really don't want to come in, but the worst ones for them were the vandals that mm -hmm. came in after hours or when no one was there. Mm -hmm. And if they had a series of, bad series of what vandalism, they all would take a turn and spend the night in the garden shed. <laughs> wow, and so what kind, so that's human activity. Yes. And then yeah. people picking without mm -hmm. asking or yeah. just causing trouble. Causing trouble or mm -hmm. sitting and um, for this particular garden was beautiful because it looked out over the countryside. It mm -hmm. was right on the edge of Bedford, so it looked out over mm -hmm. the countryside. Mm -hmm. People would come down and sit down so on the edge. Spot very so they leave garbage and they mm -hmm. leave garbage everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we each of our if we were the early garden on do on arrival, we picked up. Yeah. You know, and that was part of it. Do you feel like that's just part of being in a community? In a setting? community and being in a community yeah. setting. I mean, I have to tell you their varmints were nothing compared to the varmints here. Yeah. I mean <laughs> <laughs> the animals that I've, the I, had a pocket, <laughs> I had a pocket gopher in my garden and it was like watching Bugs Bunny movie because I'm sitting there one morning drinking my tea on my front porch and all of a sudden my computer just went. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. We I, laughed, but you must have dropped your tea. Oh, I just dropped your stroke. And, no, I let the dog out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's but, a good strategy. I yeah, yeah, but I, I mean, a lot of community in Calgary, well. let's face it, we have gophers, mm -hmm. we have deer, we have birds, rabbits, yeah. rabbits, rabbits, and the rabbits are they getting bigger? Or is it just me? Ground squirrels. Ground mm -hmm. squirrels. We have folks coming in that don't necessarily that understand community gardening in a, in a different cultural perspective. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have people that might not be reading the signage that yes. we're plastering everywhere. Well, if yeah. you're not reading yet or you don't yes. read in that language, that can be a challenge. Well, um, there's the challenges. There's people of that are hungry. hungry. Yeah, I was just going to say, and then there's the hungry people. Yeah. And I never wanted to deny anybody. I mean, I used to, I'm, I love to grow beans, and I like them up on tripods, so I'll plant them all over my allotment, and I always did. And I lost about 25% of them every year because mm. somebody picked them. But you knew to plant that much more. Yes, and I did. <laughs> I got, after the first year, I thought, you know, I think I'll put up for it's Like Bun uh -huh. Bunny again, if you can't beat them, join them, right? That's like right. So, And that's what the old boys told me, and, and a couple of the older ladies, they said, we just plant because... 
we know that they walked through the garden and were yeah. down the hill and see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was yeah. part of it. And that, yeah. you know, to me, it's a community. Mm -hmm. So we're part of a community. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, our, our yeah. hedges that I talked about, <coughs> the, they're not meant to keep the community out of the garden. Yes. But we're just trying to funnel how they get in there. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And so, it's a polite suggestion to yeah. traffic patterns. Yep. Yeah. Soil compaction. Yeah. The, being mm -hmm. by a school, a lot yeah. of community gardens are either in a busy thoroughfare coming through a field or mm -hmm. whatever, or if they're by a school, that's raised beds are a great thing to jump off of and mm -hmm. tumble around <laughs> if you're a kid. So, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think directing traffic with planting is really smart. Yeah. What do you anticipate, Shelby, with Aaron Woods? And like, do you have any plans or any proactive measures that you've kind of <laughs> thought about yet for unwanted garden attention? Um. So right now, like kind of how you mentioned about people going in and, you know, whether they're just hungry or yeah. kids and it's a snack, yeah. mm -hmm. um, we've kind of recognized it's like where our community garden is, it's right next to our community hall. And we have a food pantry box there and mm -hmm. it's always empty just because like food mm -hmm. insecurity is a very big yeah. deal in our neighborhood. And like I kind of briefly mentioned, we were able to just get a grant. So by the end of the month, we're going to have a lot of excess funds. And one of our biggest plans when we started working on this garden was to just have as many boxes as we can that mm -hmm. we would take care of. But it's mm -hmm. basically like mm -hmm. a fresh alternative to the food pantry okay. we have. Nice. And hope to so kind yeah. of hopefully dissuade them from taking yeah. from gardeners boxes because mm -hmm. yeah. we, you know, there's the boxes that no one owns. It's us who mm -hmm. are working on them. And mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of one of the things we thought of to try and that's dissuade cool. that. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, by the end of the year, um, we or by October, we will have enough food there because mm -hmm. we, we mm -hmm. don't want to grow like potatoes and carrots. And yeah, that's, fresh eating. Yeah, the, and we can. Um, you know, find someone in a community who that produce we grew can go to. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of exciting because one of the women who, who works on the committee, she's the, our local Girl Guides troop leader. And so we actually have like the Girl Guides who are helping take care of the community, like yeah, the, the cool. like food boxes. And mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, it's kind of fun to have that youth mm -hmm. engagement and have the local troop. And we also have a Boy Scout troop who has showed interest. So hopefully we Very can get, cool. yeah, we can get them into it's it. It's the young. Yeah. You know. yeah. And I think, you know, when you, if it's a younger group and they feel like, you know, that I'm helping with this or I'm involved in this, I helped create this, it's kind of less likely to. Teach them, teaching them. Uh, yeah. Show them how to pick a pea yeah, properly so, yeah. so they don't take the whole vine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know. That's, they have a point of pride. Yeah. Anytime yeah. they go through that park yeah. or near that space with their family. Well, it's interesting mm -hmm. that uh, we have a, a recent master gardener graduate who's oh. working with us, and he happens to be a scout master. Mm. And ah. he's, he's plans to bring his scouts along a few times nice. to see. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> like this, the in what you're talking about there, Shelby, we have uh, five plots that we look after that go to the Veterans Food Bank. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we have three plots that individual gardeners look after that go to the Calgary Food Bank. Mm -hmm. So that's a significant amount of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. It's interesting though with the Veterans Food Bank that uh, uh, they're, they're quite emphatic that they don't need stuff like kale. There's a few <laughs> other things they don't, they don't want any gourds or right. uh, pumpkins no. okay but squash doesn't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe things that they can't readily get can well no it's more more a question, question that our vets are all elderly people and they yeah. don't like that stuff yes. <laughs> that's an important they didn't grow up eating it they yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's an important part of planning yeah. your community garden as well yeah. as once you, you can't just sort of plunk yourself down and be like, all yeah. right, community garden, here we go. You have yeah. to understand what do people want to eat? Well, we actually, <laughs> what we, do they eat at home we actually eat? talk to them and find out what they want. The, the things that they don't want, we find out because all of our gardeners are free to donate to them when we're mm. going. So 
that's where they get this other stuff and they, they just say don't bother. <laughs> no kale? No, if you're going to give them a pumpkin, you have to give them pumpkin pie. Yeah, there you well, go, value yeah. added, yeah. right? <laughs> but we, we were talking about uh, you know issues and uh, our single biggest issue is that we're on a slope that slopes in two directions yeah. and uh, we have four drains off the community association roof that That's regularly flood us yeah so uh the community association has just gone out to bid on a project to uh, uh, regrade some of it and put in a proper drain to take that mm -hmm. overflow away so will we still be filling rain barrels oh yeah okay because not every community garden has rain barrels mm -hmm. uh, uh, or yeah. is allowed to use That's a yeah. little gray area. Yeah. Yeah, now well, that we're on Facebook Live, I'm not sure. Well, it is, <laughs> it, no, it's interesting because in our case, the uh, the garden purchased the barrels mm -hmm. uh, with the community association's consent. Mm -hmm. So we look after them. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, that brought up an interesting question. Uh, uh, they, they managed to grow some uh, unusual looking biology. In, algae, like in the rain barrels? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and uh, if the light can get in, you'll yeah. get growth in there. So yeah. uh, I've cleaned them a couple of times, but someone just suggested that, well, that stuff's all beneficial. What are you worried about? True. There's a couple of strategies there. I think one would be you're almost kind of making compost tea. And uh -huh. I mean, that's <laughs> algae, so it's not totally... And then often that's like fairly anaerobic, uh -huh. unless it's sort of stealing oxygen from the water, which yeah. might not be super great. So I would keep it off of leafy crops, uh -huh. like that you're going to eat yes. directly. Water the soil if you're going to use that. And then um, the Leaf Ninjas, uh, Jason there at the Leaf Ninjas is awesome for... He's done talks for, I think, spring events about irrigation and collecting rainwater. If you can find a way to make that outer, the, the plastic opaque. So yeah, there, well there's I, a paint that you can put on it or you can wrap it. Yeah, I, so I, I know I've, uh, from at home on. I've noticed that the black rain barrels grow more and the mm. blue ones grow less. Interesting. Mm. <clears throat> Something to do with the blue, <laughs> the blue light. Yeah, interesting. <clears throat> yeah. I wonder about that. Yeah. Who mm. knows? Interesting. We've got a question? Yes, and a couple of comments. Sure. And I, I believe Colleen Tanner had suggested you put some, like a little sachet of maybe Kathy confirm of rye seed in your rain barrel to help prevent oat straw. I've heard it's good. It's mm. it's kind of um, if you looked up pond maintenance, you can yes. put things in your pond to keep the algae from scumming up mm -hmm. the surface. And some it's of that safer to put rye <laughs> seed or rye straw into a rain barrel than. Because the sachet is it's going to a food crop, so you have yeah. to be careful. <coughs> well, that that would be troublesome. I mean, we've got four thousand gallon totes, mm -hmm. and in a rainstorm, they can fill up and. Oh five yeah, minutes, you, yeah. You know. But that's where you buy the full bag and you just put it in. Like a big in. tea bag. Big tea bag yeah. with yeah. the string. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, there's other things you can yeah. do. I have a friend who keeps fish in his. Yeah, yeah. My mom used to have an oak rain barrel and we yeah. had goldfish in mm -hmm. it in the summer. Yeah. And and she did that to keep the mosquitoes from yeah. breeding mm -hmm. out of the uh, rain It's never there long enough for mosquitoes. No, I've <laughs> just never done it here, but Oops, in Michigan. Sorry. No, that's yeah. Yeah, I think that works anyway, yeah. right there. Yeah, was there a question piece to that? Too? Just a, there's a unrelated question, but it's uh, planting on boulevards. Like, is there a things we can plant on boulevards other than grass or ways we can plant on boulevards and as well uh, thank you for sharing the ideas around diversifying the community mm. garden mm -hmm. or be, beware the city <laughs> lawnmower yeah yeah so the city has a maintenance program and we can't just sort of stomp in and think that the city's a big bad guy like there are partners you know they fund my position they're they're helping promote community gardening so um, I would check for sure. I think the first resource to go to would be the city website. I would check with it because I don't think you can plant on boulevards no. without mm -hmm. permissions or without certain things. I know that they are working on the pollinator projects on yeah. some boulevards, mm -hmm. but it hasn't gone that far. And, and as yeah. it is right now, the homeowner 
that lives behind said boulevard in some of the neighborhoods has to cut that grass. The city doesn't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they have to yeah. cut it, but it's a question of what the bylaw says within your own. Yeah, there, there are a few places I've seen it. I yes. noticed that they, they're very heavy pots. Yes. And I presumed it was so they could withstand a lawnmower hit. Yeah, and well. that's exactly, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I, I was going to say, there's the other issue is, if you're going to do it, don't put permanent plantings in there, just plant. Mm -hmm. because if Nothing they woody. Nothing. Like, you have to think about the, the, those hill strips or those areas between sidewalks and roadways. Yeah. Um, a car door needs to swing open there. Mm -hmm. Whether there's parking or not, let's say uh, an emergency vehicle needs to gain access to that spot. People need to be able to walk there. So ground covers. Um, that being said, like, we did help put in a little boulevard planting at the little red sleeping house yes. in Inglewood. And... Um, that's all pea gravel and drought tolerant um, low growing ground cut seedlings and stem top and so a I think as long as you can walk on it easily um, but yeah check the website for the the city does have information on planting on boulevards and mm -hmm. usually they require that it be some kind of container that can be moved mm -hmm. yes. it can't be a permanent planting but you'd have to look and I'm not sure if it's across all communities across the city but they do if you go on there calgary.ca you'll find it, information about boulevard planting mm -hmm. but i think there so there's another part to this that just came in i think it has to do more with the heat and potentially the dry in that space as mm -hmm. well as their recommendations for things that could be planted if it is permitted oh man and salt yeah. And mm. pollution and, and, and dog pee and, and like that's like that's like the hardest the hardiest plants would have to go in well, there into those move. plantings. Yeah. Um, there is a publication on the city of Calgary website. It's called the Good Neighbor Guide, and in there there are some things that talk about what you can and can't encroach, how wide your shed can or can't be. But it has a thing in there too about using your boulevard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a question come through. Sam would like to know why the we planted cucumbers and tomatoes last year, but why were there more leaves than fruit? Mm. Eat. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were in the shade. They might have been getting a little bit more shade or less sunlight than they want. Um, generally, they're eight hours or so or more for mm -hmm. a tomato or a cucumber plant to be really happy. So plants that are getting more shade than their use, than their desiring, will flower less, which leads to less fruiting. And also with all that really heavy heat that we have, they leak out heavier to create shade for themselves, for their roots. So mm -hmm. the cucumbers struggled a little bit for those these roots. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I keep telling people put them up on trellises. Don't mm -hmm. let them crawl along the ground. Mm -hmm. And the tomatoes last year, I noticed they really produce a lot of foliage to protect themselves from mm -hmm. the heat. So pruning a little bit of the foliage, making sure that you do some pruning in the side shoots so mm -hmm. that you get the, the, the extra pieces. That come in yeah, the, the yeah. little suckers, yeah. the little side shoots work towards that. But I did notice that they got a lot of foliage last year and it was tough. I went in with a pair of scissors and took mine back in July so that I at least got ripe tomatoes and more than mm -hmm what I started with, but it's also that. And the pollinator aspect is really important. Yeah. When, when the have... leaf is hanging over them, because yeah. you see in a cucumber, there's the boy flower and the girl flower. And quite often the male flower flowers first and there's not any production of female flowers at that point in time. And if the foliage is covering the pollinating flower, the flowers that need poll pollinating, Quite often the bug is going to make that effort, plus if the male flower isn't dominant or showing, you don't get as much production out of your cucumber. Mm -hmm. I think kind of across the board too, I don't know if you guys saw this, but just last year was drought conditions, yeah. mm -hmm. smoke in the air for a long time. Um, I know that really affected a lot of my normal heavy producers. Yeah, yeah. They just mm -hmm. kind of sort of squandered, they just sort of like, eh, they weren't very happy, it was a lot harder yeah. to keep them 
looking lush and I just kind of gave up like mid-August. I was like, yeah, whatever will be, will be. <laughs> and that's when you learn how to do things with green tomatoes. <laughs> green tomato <laughs> relish and fried green tomatoes and salsa. Well, yeah, I would say environmental stress yes. would be a big one. Yes. We might mm-hmm. see that again this summer. Lovely rain we're having the last Please little it. bit. Continue. <laughs> nice, slow, gentle soaks. And yeah, um, I mean, tomatoes are big feeders as well, so you need consistent watering. So yes, you have to that stay on there. Mm-hmm. And remember in the heat that a tomato sometimes doesn't need water just because it's baking. Mm-hmm. It's what it's doing is protecting itself. It'll literally fold up and into itself. So don't go in there without first checking that it has. Dig dry. down into the soil, soil. at least a couple yeah. inches. If it's moist down there, water the next day in the morning. Yes. Don't go out and hit it because it's wilting. Yes, because mm-hmm. they reverse their photosynthesis GMP. So mm. plants are so smart. Yes, eh? they are. <laughs> They're so adaptable. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Hopefully that helps. I think. Yeah, I, I'm really curious what the season is going to bring us weather-wise. Mm-hmm. We never know in Calgary, but it just, I'm like, man, now there's more variables that we have to think about. I, I think we're in for years of more and more variables. I think <laughs> yeah. so, too. What's begun feels like a trend yeah. of unpredictability and yeah. extreme mm-hmm. weather events. Yeah. Deb, what have you got? So what about fertilizing, then, in your community gardens? Do you use mm-hmm. compost or uh, commercial fertilizers, or and you know, could that have affected the tomato and cucumber? Uh, we spray growth. all our plots with uh, Mike Dorian's compost tea once a year. So that's Soil Solutions. Yeah, and local and, company. and we bring in. Uh, last couple of years, we brought in City of Calgary compost. Which is a good starting point, yeah. right? It's mm-hmm. not it's not sort of black gold, but it's getting there, and we can use that yeah. as a substrate to to yeah. build in good Put soil in and to build in yeah. yeah yeah. There's very few really good all-purpose fertilizers that will do the kind of coverage that you need to get things going. And mm-hmm. I find my tomatoes. I get my my Dorian comes in and puts compost tea in my garden once a month all summer long. Mm-hmm. And since I started doing that, mm-hmm. I'm doing really well. Although I've gone back to my fish fertilizer, and I'm using mm-hmm. that fish emulsion. Fish emulsion. Okay. How and does Marigold, uh, your dog, like that? Oh, she thinks <laughs> I put a, a fish somewhere yeah. in the room. She's looking <laughs> for it. Yeah. That yeah. might draw in <clears throat> some unwanted attention from skunks and such. Yeah. So sometimes people get that with a blood meal. Or yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Fish fertilizer is yeah. a little more deodorized. I'm, yeah. I'm quite in, in thinking it's really good. The other one that I have used to a great deal of success is kelp, mm-hmm. and I've had some fairly good results with that. But I grow 15 tomato plants, so mm-hmm. I, I do believe that... <laughs> you got to invest in them. <laughs> yes, I do. I invest in them probably, and the only reason I have that many, don't come for me here. <laughs> you learned how many broccoli that she planted, so... But the tomatoes <laughs> is because I want to try all the varieties. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's... What's that song? Willie Nelson, do all the girls up my face. tomatoes for me. <laughs> right on. I see a lot of toast with cream cheese on it. In yeah. The yeah no, I, and I start eating tomatoes as soon as the Paradise Hill tomatoes show up in the gar- grocery store. Mm-hmm. And you, you want to taste test. Yeah. Yeah. You should try their beef steak tomatoes right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, I'm salivating. <laughs> One other note on, on fertilizing, I think uh, Soil Solutions product with their compost tea is great. You can make your own compost Make tea. your own, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, you can take some of your aged compost that's been in the finished bin and put it in an old pillowcase or something permeable yeah. and dunk it in a big garbage can, plastic, yeah. Rubbermaid garbage can, full of water, rainwater ideally. Mm. And if stir. you can aerate it, that's the best. <laughs> if you can't aerate it, give it a stir every now and then. It'll yeah. after and put um, a lid on it because your dog likes to sit in it. It'll get so smelly. Stinky if it's anaerobic. If you're yeah. not introducing oxygen, yeah. but if you can't get a bubbler in it, put leave it for about a week to steep, and then again, don't put it on your leaf, your leafy greens that you're going to eat on the soil. On the soil, and then worm castings are another mm-hmm. thing that folks can either. Produce their own at home in a worm bin, or maybe your community garden gets creative and has some satellite composting ventures, you know, in the community association or in people in gardeners' homes. 
uh, or you can buy one castings. And that mm. that's a pretty foolproof fertilizer. There's no burning. Anyway, uh, tomatoes over like over fertilizer. Tomatoes like to be fertilized, and they yeah. use a lot of nutrients out of their soil. So even with the compost and doing mm. all of that, I try to put compost tea mm. of some sort myself about every 10 days. Yeah, every mm. couple what, of What about so. sea soil? Yes, I really yeah. like yeah. sea soil. Sea soil is a bag soil and you can buy at the garden center. Plants, if they are too dry, will not take up the nutrients in mm -hmm. fertilizers. So you never fertilize a dry plant. You water it first and then fertilize. Yeah, great question. So with the, with tomatoes, had no idea that tomatoes were that signal their situation. Are there other plants that kind of give you those kinds of visual clues about what they need or what's happening in green the garden? Ash trees, green ash trees, green ash trees <laughs> collapse their leaves so that they don't photosynthesize during the hot season. And that that is why they are a successful huh. boulevard plant is because they reverse their photosynthetic process. But that's why succulents and cacti do that. They they reverse photosynthesize in the heat of the day and shut almost virtually down during heat. Like these succulents <laughs> with their little fleshy leaves store a lot of moisture in there and then come when it gets really hot. I feel them and they almost feel limp but I know that they're wet because I check. So I look at that but in the vegetable garden if you're looking you will notice that your pepper plants will sort of collapse a little bit into themselves. And it isn't because they need moisture, they're just fighting that little battle of how hot it is and they want to come back a little easier. Root crops, on the other hand, don't do that. So you have to make sure that they get good moisture. And potatoes, for the first, up until they start to really produce the potatoes at the bottom, will reverse photosynthesize so that they can make new babies. So yeah, there's quite a few plants that have that really interesting photosynthetic property and they, they transpire at a different time. They, they do a lot of wicking, etc. in themselves. I notice my squash and zucchini leaves go and yeah. the, in the heat of the day and I just <laughs> yeah. say, I'll get to you. I don't run out and water them right no. then. I wait till I just wait till the morning and make sure I give them consistent yes. watering. Consistent in that way. The leaves, yeah. either to avoid powdery mildew, but yeah, it's a. I think plants talk to us all the time. Every single one of them does. We just have to learn their cues. There's one on the <laughs> way on on Memorial Drive. There's a front garden, and he grows squash on it. Cool. And I swear it talks to me whenever I go. <laughs> I can tell. I can take the weather from it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So it really talks to a lot of people. Like yeah. a good, sounds like a well, good yard. I'm not. I'm not weird. I just like to talk to my friends. <laughs> Well, I think like other plants might not signal to us when they need something, but for example, like garlic, Yes. we yes. know that when garlic skates, their flowers start to loopy loop. Once they loop twice, you can cut, cut them. them off. Ooh. Yeah. So, Tasty. and we've learned that <laughs> over time because if we let them go longer, that flower will put energy into producing bulbils or seeds and not so much into the bulbs below ground. That's right. So we want, that's why we're growing it is you know, the for the bulbs. And so we can have a double harvest by what, cutting what, off What about skates. potato flowers? I've heard both yeah, ways. Yeah, let's mm -hmm. hear it. Yeah. We, this is why we have calf with us yeah. tonight. <laughs> well, I, I, I've been told to pluck them off because they don't do anything except oh. use energy. Mm. Okay. Well, I believe you have to leave your potato flowers, especially since they appear in August. And what they're doing is signaling to the ground crew, the guys under the ground, they're signaling that it's really nice out here. Let's start developing some body. Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. start making better and bigger tomatoes. Potatoes. And you will notice that some of the, uh, for instance, I grow Pontiac potatoes. They are a late producer. They're a red skin. And they flower mid-August. But if you're growing some of the earlier ones, like Yukon Gold and mm -hmm. Fingerlings, they flower July, and that's usually when they start to get really tasty, oh. and that's when you harvest them. Mm. When you look at a vegetable garden, you should be looking at it from the start to the finish. You should be able to take something off to eat every week, virtually, mm. and be able to still have a harvest to put in your gold room. That's why that's my mom the kept the, well, my mom <laughs> kept the potatoes up at the top of the hill 
because they produced the most. That was the last thing out of the garden. That right? was the, the last thing yeah. because my mom was like five feet tall and she couldn't push the wheelbarrow up there. So <laughs> she'd send us up there to shove them down to her. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. We got really it. dirty in those days. So <laughs> we had a lot of fun doing it. But no, everything has a timing, but potato mm -hmm. flowers, they should stay in place. Okay. Yeah. That pollination that happens is really valuable. So when that would be a new gardener question and one for for seasoned gardeners to to you know, you know, yes. check in on when when do you harvest a potato? How do you know? Do you recommend pulling it up and seeing? No, I actually start to watch them and if you put your hand up along the, the stem mm -hmm. and just push it back and forth, it'll start to loosen itself. Mm -hmm. It okay. will start to be and then all of a sudden they'll wilt. And then they're the ready wilt to go. Is, the wilt is the sign. The wilt it's is like the with sign garlic for it. where it's like two a third of the plant or two thirds so of the plant, plant is which is it? Yeah, <laughs> two thirds of the plant is brown. Uh -huh. Although I have seen in this part of the world that we should only let one third of it go brown and then start and then pull, because otherwise the cloves will separate. The cloves will open up. Okay. And then they're pretty much only useful for seed uh -huh. cropping. Okay. So you want to leave them tight. So if they're down brown about this far, get them out of the ground. Okay. Right back to the potatoes, so when they're wilted, <laughs> that's when you're going to get the maximum harvest. Crop. Yeah. Yeah, but but lots of people want them. Yeah, you know, I know. That's where they want the little. But you see, there's all sorts of varietals that yeah. are earlier producing, yeah. like Warba and mm -hmm. I know my Pontiac's late. Yeah. Warba, Yukon Gold, the Fingerlings. Some of those ones will produce earlier. Well, I, I was reading that uh, most of the potatoes, uh, a plant's going to grow a maximum of 10 pounds no matter what you do to it. Oh, well, somebody forgot to tell my potatoes that. <laughs> well, well there, are, there are, I forget what, uh, there was two classes. One would grow lots. There's of, determinant and indeterminate, yeah. just like a tomato. There's Yeah. There's... Three kinds of tomatoes, actually. There's determinate, indeterminate, and semi-determinate. Potatoes are either determinate or indeterminate. Yeah, but if they're determinate, they're going to only grow a Yeah, they're time. only going to hit a certain, and they're the earlier producing potato. Yeah. But the later producing potato is indeterminate and will branch. And the more stems it produces, the more potatoes are down there. Well, I'm, mm. I'm willing to bet that not many of our gardeners know that. Oh, well, I mm. hope they're tuned in tonight. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have, a, wonder, so I have a wonderful experiment going on in my kitchen right now because I found four seed potatoes left over from oh. last year, <laughs> and they were in mixed into my seeds. So I pulled them out, and I sprouted them because you sprout them ahead of time, and I was chitting them, and I was watching them, and they've grown, and they're growing in the right direction. But they're producing potatoes off oh, wow. stems. Oh, wow. You'll have to get them in the ground. Soon. So i got to get them in the ground, but I'm going to bring them for tea on Thursday. Oh, right on. So show, show and tell. Show and tell. This but, has been, we're at time. Oh, we're right. at time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And as usual, I talk too much. <laughs> no, you didn't at all. You're imparting much wisdom that okay. we all need, and folks well, tuning in need to know this, too. Could I offer a definition I read about how you tell what's a weed? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a weed is a plant that has mastered every possible trick of survival in, in the natural world, except it never learned to grow in a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need straight lines anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but so they blend in. Yeah, with the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they often they're look alike too, yeah. right? Yeah, they're, they're descriptive. This eyes yeah. and themselves, and they're Trevor's traveling. And, well, that was fun. It was yeah. very fun. Thank, Thank you, you Wayne. Thank yeah. you, Wayne, Thanks. for coming in. Thank you so much, everyone, for your awesome questions and comments. And please stay tuned. Give us your feedback. We'd love to do this regularly, do this again with you. And as the season progresses, new topics come up. So I think this would be yes. fun to do again. And we wish you both a lot of luck and a lot of good weather and nice rain in your gardens. But now I have a new place to drive around and go look. Yeah. <laughs> Get up and see the Aaron Woods Community Garden and pop down and see the Mignafore Community Garden and mm. visit all the ones in between that you can. Yes. Go yes. see them there and experience. And sometimes there's people there that will actually talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> probably see me there. I'm yeah. like a bee. I visit as many 